So, I came across these three books in a second-hand shop in Dublin, one of the days, and snapped them up. I'm out of the knitting game at the moment due to a strain injury, so I thought it would be fun to try out some of the heritage styles of Irish lace. Starting with Mount Melick, which I'd never heard of, but looked the easiest on first leaf and true. Mount Melick Work, Irish White Embroidery, a survey and manual with full-size patterns by Jane Houston Almquist. And this beautiful harp on the front, look at that. I'm feeling more patriotic already. She spends a lot of time in the book going over the history of Mount Melick, which I'll talk a little more about later on. Now, she really stresses that the materials have to be right. But listen lads, I'm not dropping this kind of cash on materials for a skill that I'm having a first attempt at. So we're gonna go with a white cotton remnant, a needle, scissors, ancient rubber hoop, a thimble and a mysterious ball of cotton that I bought years ago for crochet. I think it might be a 12. Metmetic work should always be matte white thread on a cotton sateen background. Yeah, yeah, I don't want to hear it, okay? It's not real Mount Melick unless it's from the Champagne region of France or whatever. I'm using what I have on hand here. My first idea was to try and make a sampler to test out some of the stitches, but I abandoned that fairly early on in favour of just jumping in. I traced one of the designs from the book onto a bit of paper and pinned it to the back of my cotton. I then used this water erasable pen from Tesco to trace the design onto the fabric and trusted in the universe that it would wash out later. I started by putting my cotton into the mad rubber hoop. Then I made my starting knot. The book describes this as, when stitching, try to avoid the use of knots. It is far better to run in beginnings and endings of threads, taking a tiny back stitch as well. I would find that my little holding stitches unraveled while I worked this piece, which should have been a clue that I was doing them all wrong, but whatever, that's the way I did them this time around. I worked these little flower sprays in a padded satin stitch. You put some treads going perpendicular for the foundation layer, then lay treads in the correct direction on top to cover them up. This creates a 3D effect. You can do loads of layers of these to get some really fat flowers and leaves if you're so inclined. I wasn't, I finished each of these flowers with a French knot in the middle. The stems here are whipped stem stitch. It's like a little back stitch and then you put the thread back through going in the opposite angle on the top. I really like the effect of this one. Our pal Jane says, as a characteristic of Mount Melic embroidery is an effect of padded encrusted bar relief. Stitches chosen are generally those which lie on the surface of the material with as little thread as possible underneath. This whipped stem stitch leaves a nice high line with loads of texture on the top of the work and only a neat flat line of straight stitches underneath. I then outlined these roundy leaves with buttonhole stitches. Looking back now, I think these would be nicer if all the stitches were closer together and made a thick wall all around the leaf. As it is, it was all I could do to just get all the buttonholes going in the right direction and be vaguely the same size. For the thorny stems, I used the Mount Melic stitch. It's kind of like a chain stitch with a little leg coming out of it. It worked really great for the, the spiky plants. After this piece was finished, I went out into the wild and looked for some examples of Mount Melick to see if I was on the right track. One thing I learned on my travels was that Mount Melick lace does not refer to the embroidered work on the towel or placemat or whatever you're making. It actually refers to the knitted fringe all around the outside, with this tiny piece of open work here giving it the lace name. 
But the name stuck when people took the scale with them to America and Australia, so we still call it Mount Meliclays today. I continued working on the sprays, unpicking any disasters as they occurred, like this one where I sewed the floppy edge of the fabric to a flower like an idiot and then had to go back and unpick the whole flower because it was all one thread and therefore ruined. And then it happened. I'd pricked my finger Sleeping Beauty style and didn't even notice until I got a drop of finger juice on the piece and let it dry right in there. I grabbed the stain remover and a Q-tip and said a prayer to Holy God to save my lace from ruin. This kind of worked but left a larger, lighter brown puddle for me to contend with down the road. I did end up sorting this out later. Then, after the gore was over, a new kind of horror appeared. I accidentally deleted like three hours of footage. So I guess I finished this first big dog rose in that time. You can see in this clip of me jamming my work back into the cursed rubber hoop that there's some discoloration on the bouillons. I really struggled making them, so the tread is super worked and has some dirt caught up in it. One of the experts I talked to about Mount Melick said that it was actually designed to be boiled, so in the past it would have been solved by dunking it in scalded water. I had a more modern solution later on that solved it though. The stitch here to outline the petals was meant to be a wide overcast stitch, but I guess I didn't look close enough because there's meant to be a pad and tread underneath. It really helped to go back in with the pen and add another line to keep those stitches a nice consistent size. This is pretty much my first embroidery piece and from the samples I've seen, neatness was the name of the game when it came to embroidery in the convent. Mount Malik was invented by a Quaker woman called Joanna Carter. She invented a new style using Jacobian embroidery techniques but without the colours which wouldn't really have gelled with the Quaker faith. Her skill was eventually bought over by Presentation Sisters, so nuns, but the tradition of teaching Mount Malik continued. These women valued hard work, patience and attention to detail and these are things that I'm learning the hard way through making my own piece. Now for the bullion stitch, also known as wormies. Wormies are hard. The other stitches I could kind of cheese just using the knowledge of stitching you get from repairing shirts and jeans and whatever but this one was a whole new skill. You make a stitch where you want your wormie to lie. Then you come back up from the bottom through to the top of the fabric using the first hole you made. You don't put the needle all the way through or the tread. Then you use the slack tread on the top of the fabric to make wraps on your needle. And you need to make the right amount of wraps that you need for the length of your wormy. If you put too many, it won't lie flat and it'll kind of arch up like a caterpillar. If you put too little, it's just kind of a squiggly, knotty mess. And then when you have the right amount, you pinch those wraps in between your thumb and forefinger and pull the needle and the slack tread all the way through. And then you go back down through the second hole you made on your first stitch. If that sounds complicated, it's because it is. This was so hard to figure out. And my wormies aren't even that long. And they all kind of point in weird directions. The women who figured this out weren't messing around. I have hours of footage of myself making wormies and barely any of it is in frame because I am tossing that hoop around my desk, sweaty and confused. When my wormies were made, I filled the middle with French knots and then attempted some scroll stitch stems. Pulled out a long stitch, wrapped the thread around the needle and went down into the fabric where I wanted the stamen or the stigmas to end and then my flower was done. One computer failure later, possibly where the footage went missing, and all my flowers were finally done. The piece was now closer to being finished than being started, so I just had the soldier on. At this point, one of my prayers was answered. My water erase pen wasn't staying in my fabric, it was actually working really well. Maybe too well. Between crime scene cleanups, sweaty bouillon troubles, moisture in the air, and at this point, nearly two weeks of struggle and neglect. The pen on my work was starting to fade, so I took the pen, retraced some of those faded lines for any of the really faded parts where you couldn't even see what was there. I took my pattern back out and copied from that. In the old times, before Tesco sold water erasable ink pens, women would have copied their designs onto the fabric using graphite powder. 
and either embroidered their guide into place or kept retracing over and over using the graphite powder. But graphite powder is actually really messy, so it would have resulted in really grubby work. Um, they probably solved this by boiling the work, though, in the L boiling pot. At this point, there was nothing for it but to keep going. I worked in the other spray, looked in the book for some inspiration for the inner leaves, and chose the Van Dyke stitch. I did some way too long crusty satin stitch for the outside bell flowers since at this point I was running out of ideas. I've loads of footage for this so while I hop onto these bell flowers I'm going to tell you some of the biggest things that I learned from my research out in the wild. This book has a lot of samples from the Ulster Folk Museum. I rambled up there one day expecting a load of nice laces and a glass box to look at but when I went in it was actually a really like a small Edwardian town with people in it, in character. It was like a blacksmith and a printer and whatever. I checked out the clothes shop because there was lace in the window and the lady in there very kindly let me manhandle a few crochet lace corset covers before sending me up the road to the dressmaker. This lady Claire really kindly talked to me about Mount Melick for hours. Our family had actually been in the trade and she showed me some samples like heirlooms which was really special. She is a lace maker herself and gave some really practical advice. I was embarrassed showing her some footage of this piece and kind of mumbling that I'd only been embroidering since whenever this project started but she was really nice about it. She even showed me some Mount Melick that she had in her embroidery frame at the time. I'm so grateful to her, she had loads to say that couldn't be found in a book. Um, here's some of her practical advice. Number one, tread shouldn't be any longer than from your wrist to your elbow because it'll lose its twist as you work if it's too long. Number two, the needle. The eye shouldn't be any fatter than the shaft of the needle because that'll loosen up the French knots as you pull through. So your needle should be, you know, the sharp point and then the same thickness after that. It shouldn't get fatter up at the eye. Number three, she told me to ditch the hoop, <laughs> the manky rubber hoop at the start of this. And right at the end, I spotted a bigger wooden one in the shop and I bought it thinking I was an expert. She was horrified at all the creases in my pattern. If you're using a hoop, make sure all your work can fit inside it. Also make sure the inner part of the hoop is padded so you're not flattening your treads. The best thing to do is actually to swap the hoop out for a flat embroidery frame that you attack the cloth into. Four, and to be fair, I'd figured this out by the end of this piece. My starting knots, they were all wrong. I'll show you how to do them. Well, probably not right, but like a bit better in another video. She was amazing and she said she likes YouTube. So if you're watching this, Claire, hi and thank you so much. Right, enough yapping. It's time for the finishing touches. They added some more guidelines for the fancy pants stitch, also known as the cable braid stitch. It's super finicky and 3D and never looks right. And I love it. The little stems on the spray were cable stitch and adorable half and half where it's sort of like two back stitches side to side. Then in these tizzly things I did a swirly whirly. The book calls it a spider web stitch. You do an odd number of spokes and weave the thread alternately over and under the spokes to get a spiral knot on the top of your work. I deleted this footage too but I filled in the last few spiky leaves with chain stitch and then voila it was done. So after a quick bath in a Vanish Oxy Action Soak and then a rinse and then I let it dry and then I ironed it. This is how it turned out. Thanks so much for joining me on my Mount Melig learning journey. I've learned so much, but there's still plenty more to go.